fundamentally, uh, 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 our philosophy at Portworx has been this, right? And so when we started Portworx, uh, sort of alongside the Kubernetes project, uh, you know, seven, seven-ish, seven uh, plus years ago, um, what we saw happening in the enterprise data center was quite interesting. It was more of a shift toward an application-focused data center. And so let me let me kind of take a moment to describe what I mean by that. Uh, typically, uh, historically in the data center, all, all of your infrastructure technology has been very machine centric. And so if you look at the left hand side, the first class citizen in the data center is, is pretty much a machine. So an example, right, if you get an IP address, it's for a machine. If you get storage, right, we're, some, we're all storage guys here. If you get a LUN, the LUN is associated with the machine. If you secure something, it's a machine. So it's a very machine centric thought process. And so along the lines with, with the advent of how you know, DevOps and how modern applications are built, service oriented architectures and certainly containers, people realize that the application uh, and the application teams are the most important uh, component in the data center. So what's running in the data center that's important are components of an application. And so, and this is where Kubernetes comes in. It really is not just a container orchestrator, it is a new data center control plane that allows enterprises to think more application focused. And so with Kubernetes, when you, you know, secure uh, an application, you're securing a set of pods. Uh, your IP addresses are associated with pods. Uh, and similarly with storage, you're allocating storage for a, a pod or a, 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 a potentially a microservice database, for example. And so this caused Portworx to think differently. And, and our philosophy has been, Existing storage technologies are fantastic, but they're designed for a different purpose. They're designed for machine-centric consumption. And what has really changed here is modern applications, um, you know, they're distributed in nature, service-oriented architectures, components of my applications are packaged as containers. And so we needed a new storage technology that was built for DevOps, built for modern applications, built for containers. And so you asked the question, you know, um, what is different about storage and containers is sort, sort of how I look at it. If you take existing storage te uh, technologies and try and use uh, what we call connectors to connect a container to an external array, you run into a, a range of different problems. Examples include the following. Uh, protocols like NFS and iSCSI were simply not built for very high density, high velocity workloads. It's not a use case. You typically don't have hundreds of iSCSI connections going into a machine. But guess what? If you're running containers and you have 100 containers running on a machine and you're using external storage techniques, you have no other conduit other than having 100 or so NFS connections or iSCSI connections coming out of that machine. That's simply not maintainable. For those of us that are storage um, uh, or have dealt with storage admins, we know that that very quickly turns into a nightmare scenario. Um, Joe mentioned a case where, for example, a machine goes down and Kubernetes wants to relocate the application pods to other machines. If you had NFS connections or iSCSI connections hooked to that machine, that pod cannot come up anywhere else in the, in the cluster. And guess what? You have application downtime or data unavailability. And so these are the type of problems that people ran into while they were adopting Kubernetes in production environments. And so that in comes Portworx, right? So I'm going to reintroduce Portworx from a slightly different lens here. Um, and, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll use some of my demos to expand upon what um, Joe, Joe demonstrated in his section. Portworx is what is called a storage overlay. It is a software defined storage solution, but it is purpose built for container based workloads. It is designed to run inside of the Kubernetes control plane with maximum awareness of what this new control plane is doing. It has awareness of what an application looks like. An application is never just one container, right? It's a, it's, it's the, these are distributed um, microservice architectures. Take an example like a Cassandra database. There's easily you know, half a dozen containers running on half a dozen different systems comprising of one um, uh, uh, stateful database. And so Portworx has knowledge of this kind of application construct, what this application looks like, the fact that this application is six different containers running on six different systems. And so when we do storage provisioning, we have to take into account the makeup of that application. So we have to provision six different volumes on six different uh, servers. Uh, we have to make sure that the failure domains of where we're placing the data is intact so that the Cassandra application, if, if a rack goes down, the entire uh, Cassandra ring doesn't go down. Um, we have to do the data placement in such a way that there is no IO contention 
We certainly don't want different containers from within the same Cassandra application competing against each other for the IO bandwidth. That would defeat the purpose of how Cassandra wants to shard itself, right? So all of these things need to be taken into account with the, with the modern applications, with cloud native applications. So back to this diagram, uh, Portworks is software defined storage. It is a storage virtualization software that is designed to work with any infrastructure, not just pure hardware. We support any um, arrays out, out there. You can have servers with direct attached drives. You could have SAN from any vendor, EMC, HP, uh, certainly pure. And when we're running in the public cloud, we leverage the cloud providers uh, storage infrastructure. For example, in AWS, we will use EBS drives from here, Portworks, by virtualizing the underlying storage, it provides container granular virtual volumes. The properties of these volumes are such that the volume is associated with a container, not a machine. Wherever in the cluster that container needs to run, we will guarantee that it has access to its volume. Um, and that, that is accomplished by Portworks doing the synchronous replication under the hood in an application and infrastructure uh, specific way. This will become more clear in my demo. Um, to set the stage up, uh, let me skip past this and I'll come back to that slide. To set the stage up for the demo, um, I will have three machines. Uh, each machine in my case has a, a, a local drive, but Portworx, when it's deployed, it itself runs as just another container in the cluster. So there's a Portworx agent running on every node in the Kubernetes cluster. The first thing it does is it virtualizes your underly underlying infrastructure. It uh, fingerprints your environment, goes and detects the type of infrastructure you have. You could have servers with um, NVMe, SSDs, spinning drives, uh, and external SAN. Portworx will fingerprint the environment. And from here, uh, in my demo, I'll deploy a SQL database. The SQL database will get a container granular virtual volume from Portworx. It is not tied to any of the underlying uh, hardware. It is associated with this virtual volume. So in my demo, what I'll do, is um, uh, demonstrate something that is of utmost important to running a production cluster. What happens if there's a machine pro uh, failure, maybe a power outage, drive failure. So we'll power down one of the machines and you'll see that that MySQL container can uh, uh, relocate to any other healthy node in the environment and continue to run without any loss of access to its data. So that'll be the first demo that I show. Um, and before I do that, I wanna mention a couple of other things that are important. Density, right? We find that with Kubernetes, um, you know, typically people are building uh, multi-tenant environments where they have a number of different users on the same Kubernetes cluster, or even just how applications are constructed. You easily have hundreds of containers per pod, uh, sorry, per machine, and thousands in the cluster. So it's not uncommon to find thousands and thousands of containers running in the cluster. So scale and density is very important. Portworks being lightweight and designed for this kind of scale and density and and as uh, Joe mentioned, high velocity workloads, right? So people are constantly bringing up applications and tearing them down. Maybe they're doing simulations, AI, ML, analytics. These are all popular workloads for, for Kubernetes. And so just imagine a TensorFlow pipeline that needs to spin up, bring up a whole bunch of containers and then uh, get torn down and a new pipeline gets spun up. So it's a very uh, dynamic environment as Joe mentioned. And so Portworx can cope with that. Um, I will do another demo um, which, uh, in which I will show how Portworx can migrate data between clusters. And in my cl uh, demo, I'm going to show a hybrid cloud environment. We'll move applications in its entirety from an on-prem environment to the public cloud. I just really want to say you're doing an awesome job because I have no idea what the hell any of this stuff was about. And you did a fantastic job breaking it down and making it fantastic and explained. So I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. And, and, you know, um, honestly, uh, as much as I, uh, we can talk about this, um, I find that a demo speaks a thousand words. So um, this... Uh, Before you go on, I want to ask a question that they don't know a good spot to ask it, so I'm going to ask it now. Do you run any worker nodes on the arrays themselves? Like, so, like in the pure run platform? No. Great question. We do not. So, um, uh, and, and please, if I interpreted your question incorrectly, let me know. So an example is the pure array. Can you run um, any workloads inside of the pure array? And the answer is no, not because of, um, you know, anything about the technology preventing it. Um, uh, typically, up until now, it has not been a very common ask or a use case uh, to run in, in, in that kind of an appliance form factor. 
though the thought has crossed our mind. No, no, the comment wasn't can you, is do you, because it seems to me that if you ran worker nodes on the arrays, there's no reason you can also put Campo Verde into one of those containers and provide your NFS services through containers that way. So um, there, are, um, there are, I think, um, again, uh, and, uh, uh, it, it's probably the way I'm, I'm parsing your question. We, so from Portworx, we do expose NFS services so that external workloads can access um, the storage that's being consumed by the Kubernetes cluster. But uh, today we're not running any of our workloads inside of the array itself, uh, just because today in, in how, in, in, and if this is pure you're talking about, there's, um, there's not enough room there to, to, to run ex, uh, extra workloads. Okay, fair enough, but there is that pure run platform and maybe it's I'm getting one array mixed up with the other, but there is room to run some workload on those. And it's, if you're not doing it, it's fine. I just want to know if that was- today. Yeah, today we're not. And, um, and possibly some of these things are on, on the roadmap. Um, I'll, uh, I don't have that information, unfortunately. So I can probably later on circle back and, and um, um, research that a little bit and let you know if there are any plans to do that. Sounds yeah, good. today Portworx as is, is uh, strictly um, distributed as software only, meant to run on, on the worker nodes that are running outside of uh, you know, any of the storage uh, arrays out there. So they're, they're running on the compute, node, uh, com uh, compute platform. We're very much a compute centric solution, less so storage. Though the services we're providing are storage services, um, the persona of who runs Portworx and manages Portworx is somebody that's managing the Kubernetes cluster. So it would be somebody like the OpenShift administrator or in the public cloud, somebody that's managing the AWS footprint. Um, so they really don't have access to the arrays uh, or the ability to modify the arrays or um, um, you know, basically install software on it today. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Um, so this, uh, Sorry, Gu, um, just so before you go on, just, just a quick question. You, you mentioned before about, um, uh, putting containers in the right place, keep them running. Uh, but you also talked about the storage. Do, do you also ensure that the storage element that may be sat on some underlying infrastructure, be it an array or whatever, that you make sure that the storage is always as close to the container as it needs to be the application container? Yeah, exactly. So um, you're here. Uh, uh, the, I was going to get to that, and that's a little bit more of an advanced section of this presentation. I don't want to not answer your question now and leave that leave that question hanging. There is something called Stork, and I actually have that over here. And you can you can search for um, you know Google Stork in Kubernetes, and it'll get to our GitHub uh, GitHub page over here. Um, but Stork essentially does that, right? It, um, on its own, Kubernetes makes all of its scheduling decisions based on CPU and memory. Um, but with Stork, it can make intelligent scheduling decisions for stateful applications. An example is this, um, you know, just because um, I have a machine out there that has a lot of CPU and RAM may not be the best machine to run a SQL database on because um, you know, the, the IO in the back may be overloaded. And so, and so how does Kubernetes know this? And so with Stork, Stork feeds that kind of intelligence into Kubernetes. Part of that is this notion of hyperconvergence or the ability to run a workload as close to its data as possible. Um, in cases where people are running uh, uh, you know, their Kubernetes cluster on servers with locally, locally attached drives, it is possible that Stork will make the SQL database run on the machine that has the data itself. But uh, it's a very important part of our technology and I'll, I will cover that again in a little bit more detail. Um, That's great, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Uh, by the way, uh, the demos I'm showing are publicly accessible. If you go to docs.porx.com, um, there is a section uh, here called Interactive Tutorials. And if you click that, uh, it will take you to um, uh, the uh, a, a, a section where there's it's called education over here. Any of these are live tutorials that we host. I, I think a lot of you are familiar with Katakoda, which is I think part of O'Reilly now, but we host an environment for about 15, 20 minutes. That is what I'm showing over here. This is a Postgres uh, demo. The, th the key things that I wanna show here are what I kind of outlined in my slides. Uh, so we'll talk about um, how Portworx runs, uh, some of the SDS aspects of it, but also the high availability uh, uh, concepts. And so um, for those that wanna get more detail uh, into how it's working, uh, uh, the, how the storage part is working, happy to answer questions on that. Um, this, uh, to install Portworx, what one would do is go to install.portworx.com. 
And uh, it would, um, and so this is what our customers typically do, right? These are again, OpenShift administrators or somebody that's managing the cloud footprint would select, um, uh, you know, we have essentials. I'm gonna show the Portworx enterprise version. You would essentially uh, answer just a few basic questions about your environment. Um, we, I'm gonna select the latest Portworx version, which is uh, 2.7. And uh, you would even either select whether you want to run on-prem or in the public cloud. We support any of the large hyperscalers in the public cloud. Portworx will configure itself to talk to the public cloud providers' um, uh, storage services so that Portworx will manage the backend footprint. So you don't even have to worry about, um, hey, how do I use EBS? How do I use persistent drives? Portworx has all of that figured out. We work closely with all of the hyperscalers. We're constantly updating our algorithms uh, for new storage types that they're introducing. So if you're running in AWS, you can just pick AWS. If you're running on-prem, you can simply have Portworx go in and auto detect your environment. So you don't even have to tell us you have SSDs or NVMe. Portworx figures all of that out. Regarding your array question that you had asked, Portworx will even figure out if it's an external array, what kind of array it is and how to leverage that array's technology. Um, I usually leave the networking blank um, and you would select your Kubernetes distribution. Uh, mostly people would just select none. If you're running OpenShift, there are some specific nuances behind OpenShift, but that's about it. At this point, you get this install spec string. So you can see here that it's a Kubernetes install, right? And if you do this, Kubernetes will go ahead and install Portworx in its cluster the correct way. Um, in this environment, I have already done that. This is a four node Kubernetes cluster. You'll see here that I have a single master and three worker nodes. And uh, if I query Kubernetes, you'll see here that Kubernetes is managing Portworx. So again, the life cycle of Portworx, upgrading Portworx, or if you were to expand your Kubernetes cluster, you don't have to worry about provisioning Portworx to it. It's all taken care of by Kubernetes. Kubernetes will upgrade Portworx, provision Portworx to new nodes, uh, take care of its entire life cycle. What I'm going to do here, um, since this is a technical audience, I'm going to break out of script. And what we'll do is go to one of the worker nodes. Not that anybody is doing this normally, but uh, so now I'm on a worker node. So this is a little bit, um, um, you know, um, it, it, this isn't something people would do in, in production, uh, but I want to poke around the system and show you what's going on. If you were to query the portwork status, You'll see here that Porix has detected that this is a three node environment. Each node has a 20 gig local drive. Therefore, I have a global overlay capacity of 60 gigabytes. Therefore, I can create 61 gig PVCs, um, 32 gig PVCs. I can kind of carve this up however I want. You'll also see here that Porix is managing the backend physical media. We know that this is a magnetic disk. It is currently healthy. If there were something uh, to happen to this drive, Portworx in conjunction with Stork will take care of it. Stork can tell Kubernetes, hey, this drive is uh, unhealthy. Let's move this workload to a different system. And so all of that is taken care of behind the scenes. And I'll show some of that. If I list the volumes, you'll see here that there are no volumes. It's a brand new environment because we really haven't done anything yet. So let's go ahead and uh, look at the end user experience. A big part of what we do here at Portworx is simplicity. It's that focus on the DevOps experience, the fact that people don't wanna care about storage. At the end of the day, storage has to be the most boring part of your stack. And so we really try to make it boring in the sense that um, we basically almost all of the functionality from an end user perspective is automated and behind the scenes. Um, typically an end user of Portworx does not know that they're using Portworx. So to that end, what um, you would do as platform architects are you would create these uh, storage classes. So in this uh, demo, what I wanna do is run a database. So I'm going to request high IO priority because presumably this is a production environment. Um, as an end user, you'll see here that the end user is only talking to Kubernetes. So using Kubernetes, they create a one gigabyte volume. In the back, if I were to go in and see what's going on, you'll see here that Portworx has understood that Kubernetes uh, or the end user wants to create a volume. Portworx has dynamically uh, created a one gig PVC. It is currently detached because there is no application using it. So let's switch back as the persona of an application owner. As an end user, I simply want to run a Postgres database. So what I'm going to do here is um, this is my Postgres YAML. I'm going to ask Kubernetes to create my Postgres database. And uh, in under a matter of two seconds, I already have a Postgres database up and running. 
So a lot of this is the power of this new Kubernetes control plane. Without having to talk to a storage administrator, I created a volume. Without having to talk to networking, compute, admins, um, I just created a database uh, of my liking. If I go to the back and I list the volumes, you'll see here that Porix has dynamically attached that volume on dot 61 because that was one of the preferred nodes. Um, again, to the question that was asked earlier, um, that uh, Stork determined that, that on that node, the data can be local. So that database is now running on dot 61. So as an end user, I care about my database. What I'm going to do here is um, I'm now going to connect inside of the database. So currently I have exec into the uh, Postgres container. For the storage um, 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 uh, 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 guys on the line that want uh, some details on what's going on, if I were to do an LS block, you'll see here that the Portworks virtual block device that Joe was talking about is attached inside of the container. This volume is a virtual device that is part of that container. Anywhere in that cluster that container wants to run, that virtual block device is associated with it. And Portworks is managing the data protection behind the scenes. Um, I'm going to go a little bit faster here in the interest of time because there's a couple of more interesting demos and, and, and sessions coming up. Uh, what I'll do here is um, I will create a database called PX Demo, and uh, I'm writing about 5 million records to this. The reason I'm doing this is while this database is running, I'm actually going to shut this machine down. But before I do that, let's just uh, uh, look at a couple of other things. If I were to inspect this volume, I want to call out a couple of details here that um, you'll see all of the information and metrics that's being provided by Portworx is that container granularity, right? So we're telling you which namespace this volume is being consumed in. We even know that it's a Postgres database. If it were encrypted, we'd show you which key system it were encrypted with. We're showing you the amount of space being used. Um, um, we can set quotas on a namespace or an application basis. So people are typically using tools like Prometheus to monitor their environment and they're getting this very rich container and application granular metrics. Okay, so let's do this. This, um, this is my database. Um, oh, let's just see, let's take note on which, keep note that it's running on dot 61. So let's go over to machine dot 61 and simulate that machine going down. What I did here is um, I, I uh, abruptly shut that machine down and what's going to happen here is Stork and Kubernetes are going to detect that a worker node went down and therefore took down a whole bunch of databases with it. And what will happen here is in under a matter of um, like 10 or so seconds, Kubernetes relocated all of the applications running on that machine to a different node. Um, let's go to the back and see what happened. You'll see here that Portworx moved that virtual volume from dot 61 to dot 65. And as far as the application owner is concerned, uh, I'm going to log back into the database. And uh, that's my 5 million records, no loss of access to my data. So as far as the, uh, just so just imagine you're running, um, you know, even a modest 30 node Kubernetes cluster, you have hundreds of developers on it running applications, a machine goes down. Um, you know, you, the last thing you want to do is a developer call in and say, hey, I was running a container, it got lost, and somebody has to go find out where that container was, where its data is, uh, bring up that container on some other machine. Um, that's not what Kubernetes is about. That's not what DevOps is about. That's not what agility is about. You want the entire infrastructure to be automated, self-healing, uh, react to failures, and, and at the end, end of the day, just let the developers continue to run without having to worry about infrastructure. Thank you. Um, could, could I ask, because uh, uh, obviously a lot of the use cases you've talked about here is about availability and, and recovery. Um, but it, it just got me thinking with that kind of conversation about developers. You know, is this something that, you know, I, I start a new developer team in a new country and I want to get, you know, some infrastructure close to them. Is that the kind of thing I could use this for as well? So I could drop into this and say, yeah, spin me up some stuff over here in the in the public cloud, but near my developers. It is, and that is a good segue to an, another demo and use case <laughs> that I was going to talk about. Um, it's just that really we rehearsed like this, it. and we really didn't. <laughs> yeah, it, it's uh, it's 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 teeing things up nicely for me here. Um, so hold on to that because I want to set uh, your scenario up a little bit more with with a with a slide on that. Um, but uh, j just before I do that, right, just a couple of other things, just around capacity management and things like that. All of that is kind of built in into Portworx. Um, so, you know, to prove that point, what I'm doing here or in this script is I induce a different kind of failure where now uh, you'll see here that Postgres panic because what happened is I tried to write too much data to it. 
Um, if you go to the back and you're to inspect the volume, you'll see here that Porex has thrown an alert saying that, hey, this volume is running low on capacity. Um, so we're gonna pause it because this namespace is out of quota space. And so normally this too is a problem because somebody has to now call a storage administrator and say, I was running a database, ran out of capacity, can you help me expand it? That's a big pain to cut, to do in a highly dynamic and, and dense environment. But um, in this case, because I have this software defined storage that is Kubernetes aware, I can simply execute a Kubernetes command to resize the volume. Now, if I go to the back, you'll see here that the volume is back to green status because it has been virtually resized to 10 gigabytes without bouncing the application, without altering storage, moving containers around and, and so on. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is um, Portworx, software defined storage, purpose built for container workloads. Um, I have a deep dive slide here I'd like to get to. Um, I'm just uh, looking at the clock here as well. So um, I'll go through this really quick and happy to come back to this. Um, the way this work all works is, uh, and, and this again goes back to the differences between Portworx and, and um, tra traditional techniques. Portworx is bringing the storage processing into the Kubernetes control plane. And this is a really important point. So we don't use network-based protocols like iSCSI or NFS to provision storage to a container because the protocol lacks application awareness. And we really, you, with NFS or iSCSI, you, you can't tell who's the consumer at the other end of the wire. Um, uh, how do I know that it's Postgres consuming storage versus Cassandra? Because I may want to apply different uh, processing profiles, right? But because Portworx is running in conjunction with Kubernetes, we know that it's a MySQL database or a Postgres database, or that this application is going to induce sequential workload versus random 4K workloads. So we have all of that information. In fact, an example, if we wanna take a snapshot, Portworx can get inside of the applications, uh, 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 inside of the application container, quiesce the database. So that includes flushing the database and then taking a snapshot. So um, all of this kind of makes uh, the life cycle of managing applications, stateful applications in Kubernetes a lot easier. Um, let me just pause here and see if there are any questions on this diagram because I wanna to get to that, um, the, the, the workload scenario that we were just discussing. Uh, almost a bit, a bit of a side question. I, I can see there's an absolute mountain of, of functionality and enablement within Portworx, but it, it what form of governance or restrictions are there to stop, you know, random developer using up all the space or deleting all the workloads or um, how is it controlled? Great, so, great question. So Portworx follows the Kubernetes model to do that. In fact, we, we've been working with the Kubernetes community for, from the beginning to, um, to develop these uh, concepts and make them first class citizens in, within Kubernetes. We were one of the co-developers of this thing called CSI, which is the container storage interface, which allows Kubernetes to interact with um, storage systems in the back. But um, part of that is um, influencing Kubernetes RBAC and its security model to enforce restrictions even on storage. And so if you, um, uh, this is sort of another uh, deep dive into just that, but if you uh, look for Portworx and RBAC, um, it'll bring you to a, a documentation page that talks all about um, how Portworx can um, uh, apply restrictions on namespaces and quotas and prevent users from, not just from a security perspective, clear, that, that itself is another big area, right? Uh, so we support bring your own key encryption, um, so that, you know, if you and I are running on the same system, there's no way we could ac accidentally get our wires crossed. But your question, I suspect, wasn't that. There are ways in which um, you can ensure that I, I don't become a noisy neighbor, for example, and consume all of the IO so, and squeeze you out. Um, but uh, similarly, um, um, you can make sure that I don't uh, consume all of the storage space, leaving you with none. And so there's all of those rules built in. That's a great question. You've spoken a lot about kind of uh, upstream integration in, and knowing, <clears throat> knowing about the Kubernetes infrastructure and the applications, but how about downstream? You, you support any form of block storage, but what happens if there's a problem at the underlying array or you've got a bad storage administrator that's thin provisioned something and the array's running out of space? All of those kind of downstream problems, are you just blind to those or have you got integrations? Is there a benefit to being pure storage at that yeah. side so you can talk to it? What, what happens okay. downstream? Yeah, okay. So um, um, many different points there. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to mention that Portworx is infrastructure agnostic. So there's nothing specific about Portworx and Pure at all. 
Um, th there are some better together enhancements that we're working on, but generally speaking, all of those problems you talked about uh, around, uh, you know, a LUN going bad or the back in, you know, the LUN disappearing can happen, for example, um, virtual provisioning problems, um, routability problems to the back end storage. All of those, uh, the, the buck stops here, the buck stops with Portworx. We, we take care of circumventing against those problems. We're constantly monitoring the backend storage health. Uh, there's a module that's part of Portworx called Autopilot. And Autopilot's job is to make sure that the backend storage is healthy. In fact, um, it, when, when, when allowed, uh, Autopilot can manage the backend storage and allocate storage for you. Uh, clearly, this doesn't work with a static array, but this works in dynamic environments or virtual environments like VMware and in all of the hyperscalers. So Portworx can um, talk programmatically to the AWS APIs, um, Azure's APIs, and so on, and manage the backend storage. Long-winded way of saying, um, yes, Portworx will uh, cope with any array or disk-related problems. Okay, so um, let me just kind of uh, skip ahead to um, the question that was uh, being asked uh, just a while ago around uh, portability. And um, the, I think the example was, I, I, I have a new development team that I'm standing up in India and I wanna push sort of a workload to them, I think was the example that was used. Um, and, and I'll kind of go through exactly that demo. But uh, as th this kind of is, is uh, um, uh, similar to Joe's scenario, but um, what we find is that um, people with, when, 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 with, with the DevOps and people deploying Kubernetes and cloud native infrastructure, you have a fleets of Kubernetes clusters that you're managing. Maybe, you're, maybe for DR, maybe for blue green uh, uh, scenarios, um, maybe you have just a development and a staging and a production cluster, um, or you just have uh, mi migratory workloads. You have, um, and, and there's a, a really good um, edge computing scenario that I'm going to talk to you about in, in just a bit. So um, part of data portability and mobility across clusters is something that's a first class citizen of Fortworks. And that's the demo that I'm gonna show you now. In order to do that, let me share a new portion of my screen. Um, I have in this demo, uh, I'm, I'm using Tmux, so I have two screens. I'm dialed into an uh, OpenShift cluster that is running on-prem. Uh, actually, it's running in a virtual environment. So on my right-hand side, I'm running on-prem, and in my left-hand side, I have a completely different Kubernetes cluster running in AKS. So I want to point out two things here. Not only are, is this two different infrastructures, but there are two different Kubernetes distributions, so OpenShift and AKS, okay? Um, very similar to my previous demo, let me expand this window. I have a uh, single PVC bound to my Postgres uh, deployment. So it's a very similar environment to my Postgres database. And uh, logging into Postgres, you'll see here the 5 million records and the script that generated it. So nothing fancy, Postgres database backed by a Portworx volume uh, running in OpenShift. Okay, so Stork, we talked about Stork, which provides Kubernetes with that storage intelligence. It also is the backbone for doing federated data management across fleets of Kubernetes clusters. So in order to leverage that capability, the first thing you do is you generate a cluster pairing certificate, and then you go ahead and you copy that in to your target cluster. And then at your target end, you ask it to pair itself with the on-prem cluster. So at this point, and so there are a couple of configurable ports that need to be open. Obviously, all of the communication is secure. At this point, my AKS cluster is synchronized with my on-prem cluster, okay? So um, really all I've done is I've established a trusting relationship between two clusters. Now my AKS cluster is ready to be a uh, DR target, a backup target, or a migration recipient from my on-prem cluster. So in order to show that, the most basic thing I do, I can show you is, I can ask it to migrate my Postgres database. Now keep in mind that this is a very application aware and Kubernetes aware tool. What it does is it takes an application consistent snapshot and starts migrating all of the data. And we'll wait for this to synchronize. And at this point, not only does it move the data, but it recreates all of the necessary Kubernetes objects to make this application usable in the public cloud. So that means it had to recreate a storage class. It had to recreate a PVC in the correct namespace. And it also had to create the container image. So you'll see here now that I have that same Postgres database running in Azure. 
And if I log into the database, that's all of my data. Now, to get an application working, it's more than just the data, right? It's the container and all of the Kubernetes objects and metadata associated with it. Things like ingress controller, load balancer, DNS entries, all of that can be programmed as I move my workloads from one cluster to another. In fact, um, to that example that we were talking about earlier, if I want to move a developer called Eric from my on-prem to the public cloud, I can ask Stork to tell me everything that's running in Eric's namespace on-prem, and it'll say Eric is running these five applications, and I can wholesale migrate an entire namespace from my on-prem to the public cloud. You can, you, can, you can do this through the CLI, there's a GUI associated with it too, but uh, most of our customers just use this programmatically through CLIs or CRDs, or more recently uh, through uh, techniques like GitOps. Let me just pause there and uh, see if there are any questions in, in, um, in, that, uh, in that demo that I showed. So we have, uh, you know, again, um, um, I would say a good 80% of our customers that have a cloud footprint are also hybrid cloud users. So a lot of people have on-prem data centers and the public cloud, maybe they're using it for DR purposes um, uh, or they burst into cloud. But one of my favorite use cases is actually a uh, edge workflow use case. So this is a retail chain, um, uh, which I can't name who it is, but just imagine that they have a lot of edge uh, clusters or by edge, I mean um, uh, uh, satellite offices and stores. Um, and so it's a facial recognition type of application. And so they run uh, Spark jobs in containers at their edge or at their stores. And, um, so, and, and the edge clusters, um, are, these are fairly small, right? A lot of times they run in VMware, so low power devices. And in some cases they need to leverage GPUs for additional data processing. So using Kubernetes, they will collect the data at the edge, uh, move some of the, uh, work, um, the data into the core, which happens to run in Amazon EKS GPU enabled clusters, where they do additional data processing and the results then are shared back at the edge. All of this kind of data movement and data sharing uh, is all facilitated by Portworks. Portworks has the notion of shared volumes as well. Um, there was a question asked earlier around NFS. Um, Portworks can export the data over NFS to uh, legacy workloads or external workloads. Uh, but Portworks supports uh, shared volumes where multiple containers can access the same data at the same time. And just um, maybe just quick one. I if appropriate, how, how much of this are you automating? You're automating this all of the time. So, you know, there's a requirement to do something in this new location because it's appropriate. You can automate the whole process. Yeah, I think so. That uh, use case specific automation typically is implemented by the end user, right? It's a it's a very workflow uh, centric, um, um, you know, we provide the tools to allow you to automate, but we don't know what to automate. And that really depends on the workflow that you're trying to accomplish. And so we expose, you know, data mobility, data encryption, data shareability, um, uh, uh, maybe data cloning, right? So sometimes data needs to be cloned because uh, there may be parallel pipelines you uh, bring up. All of those uh, basic concepts are exposed by Portworks programmatically through a CLI or more um, um, uh, appropriately through Kubernetes, through the notion of uh, CRs, CRDs, um, uh, custom resources, right? So that so the, an intent would be put in through Kubernetes that something needs to get cloned and Portworks would pick up on that and implement it. Yeah, but that workflow um, um, clearly has to be implemented by the customer. So I'll wind this down um, and uh, take it to um, to the uh, to you know just kind of uh, how Portworks is differentiated. So what we really talked about is um, in, in my section is the core container SDS, um, and and our vision is to build the best container software defined storage. It takes the following um, um, I guess uh, key elements. Uh, number one, you need to have obviously performance and scale. Right? We talked about density. Uh, high velocity workloads. Um, yeah, you need to be low low footprint. Uh, so all of that is an important part of this. But um, uh, kind of going um, uh, clockwise here, Stork is an integral part of Portworx's differenti uh, differentiating functionality, right? It, it's what gives us that application awareness. It's what makes Kubernetes usable for enterprise workloads because otherwise um, you have a Kubernetes tied to a storage administrator, quite frankly. Um, 
Autopilot, you talked a little bit about, I mean, uh, there was a question asked earlier about what happens if the backend storage gets damaged, unavailable, hardware failures. That's Autopilot's job to make sure that uh, Kubernetes doesn't go off the rails, uh, to take corrective action. And in the last worst case scenario, uh, raise an appropriate alert to, um, to, to have somebody go in and correct the right thing, as opposed to going in and having to hunt and figure out what, what went wrong. Cloud Drives is a module that programmatically talks to the hyperscalers and, and um, including VMware and can manage the backend storage. Uh, we do a lot of work with Intel around optimizing for different kinds of workloads. And uh, the monitoring is very application aware as opposed to being generic. So it's less useful for a storage product to say, um, you know, here's how many IOPS are being consumed on this machine. What does that even mean? Because that machine could be running workloads from 10 different users. Um, with, uh, with Portworks, you can tell how many IOPS are being consumed by a specific user or application or namespace. But um, it's more than that, right? We realize that just having uh, a really good Kubernetes aware container granular SDS is not uh, enough. There was a question asked around workflows. So a big part of Portworks is providing the hooks to implement various workflows that are important to you. Um, could be disaster recovery, migration, um, I went through an IoT, uh, sort of an edge use case. So 5G edge um, is a very big, uh, um, you know, use case for Kubernetes in general. But, um, you know, we do, we see a lot of, uh, um, you know, activity in that area. Um, and then being very application focused. 